Blender 4.5 is almost here. And if you didn't know, this is actually one of our biggest updates we've ever gotten. And I think that's because they're paving the way for the release of Blender 5.0 later this year. And in today's video, we're going to dive into the five best new features that they are adding. If you stick around to the end of the video, I'll also tell you a little bonus feature that I'm really excited about. But with that being said, let's dive in. Now, I feel like this one should be making a bigger splash than it is, but I wanna talk about the set mesh normal node that they've added to geometry nodes. It has a new feature to allow you to create custom normals within geometry nodes, also using this new normal mode they call free, which is basically free on performance, which is awesome because you can use this node to blend two objects together without changing the topology or the materials. This is perfect for things like hard surface modeling, where you wanna put a lot of doodads and gizmos onto your characters and make them appear as if they're blended in without creating incredibly dense geometry or ruining the normals of your base objects. It's also really great for creating kind of blobby characters. As you can see here, I've blended a couple simple shapes together to create this character and make it appear as if it's all one mesh and model. The exciting thing about this is that with simple little objects like this, you can blend them together and create simple rigs, meaning that it's a lot easier to kind of model these characters for beginners as opposed to having to have really complex or dense topology. Now this was possible before, and in fact, here's a great example here from Blender Secrets, which is one of my favorite YouTube channels, where he shows how to do it with a data transfer node. The problem with this older method is that it requires a large modifier stack and it actually can affect the viewport performance as well whereas the set mesh normal node can be done on the simple node setup, and it's also basically free on performance. Here you can see an example when I did a remesh modifier on my turtle character here from an older tutorial, and you can see how slow it's moving in the viewport. When I switch it over to the set mesh normal node here, I get a very similar effect, and yet it runs perfectly in the viewport. I'm actually working on a tutorial right now showing you how to create this node setup and how to create it as a node tool so you can access it in any of your scenes and quickly apply it to your characters. If you'd like to know when that video is coming out, hit that notification bell so that they notify you. Now the asset browser got two really cool updates. First of all, they added a screenshot mode. So if you've ever been working on something yourself that you wanna save into the asset browser, you will know here, let's grab this one here. If I press the end panel here, if I refresh it, this is the typical screenshot it would give me, just the simple viewport window from wherever the camera is. However, if I wanted to go ahead and do something a little bit flashier or easier to recognize, I would then need to render out that image and then re-import it and then make sure it stays with the file and travels with the file. Well, now we can just go ahead and take screenshots right in Blender. So I will grab the energy shield here and I will click the capture screenshot preview. And they've made it insanely easy to use. All you need to do is click this little drop down menu here, and then you can drag and drop a little square around your viewport. It will snap that as a screenshot and automatically use it as a thumbnail. Now, if you're like me and you have a lot of assets in your asset browser, this is really great for quickly visually organizing your assets. Now, this other feature, if you're like me, is a lifesaver because I store a ton of assets here in my asset browser, and sometimes it can be really difficult to go through all of them, even with the collections over here, which is why I am grateful that they have added a horizontal list view. Now, if I click this here, you can see it gives me a small preview and I can quickly scroll through everything and this is intended to work with large asset collections. So this is a really cool feature that they've added. By the way, if you like using the asset browser, check out some of my product packs. I have the dynamic visual effects pack, a pack geared towards helping you create anime stylized visual effects with easy customizable to use controls. Or you can check out my crafty asset pack, which has a bunch of materials and other assets to help you create stylized scenes. They both have free options as well, so you can download those demo files. But let's get back to the video. Blender 4.5 gave us a bunch of new features for lighting, which allows for easier realism and some more control as well. So let's take a look at those new settings. Now, if you know me, you know that lighting is one of my favorite parts of 3D. And here I've created a little example scene of this kind of like Hobbit library that we're going to use. Now, if I go around here, I'm going to grab my sunlight here, which is pointing into the window. If I turn that on and off, you can see how it is affecting the scene there. We're gonna take a look at these new options here. So first up is temperature, which is measured in Kelvins. Now, if you're not familiar with what Kelvin temperatures are, check out this website and this nice little chart they've made. You can see here that it goes from 800 to 20,000 here. I think blenders goes from zero to 10,000. And you can see over here in the 800 range, you get things like embers or candles. And then as you bump up to things like 2800, you get incandescent light, which are your house lights. So are tungsten or halo. 
Now, fluorescent lights are going to be around 4,300 to 4,700. And then once you start getting into sunlight, you get around 5,600. Now, then after that, you get into what they call blue light, which are going to be things like your monitors. So typically, you're going to keep everything between the 800 to kind of 7,000 Kelvin temperature range if you want realism. But when you add your lights to your scenes, take a look on here and see what type of light it is. And you can use these temperature to get realistic temperature colors. And to enable that temperature, all I have to do is check it on and then I can set my color. So if I set around 5600 for daylight, that will then go ahead and create a more realistic daylight. However, here with the tint, this will then tint on top of that color. So if I want to get the pure Kelvin value, I need to set the saturation here to zero. And you can see how we're getting a very realistic daylight color. This tint here in combination with temperature is just for stylization control. And if you've ever seen these lighting gels that they use on film sets, that's essentially the same thing. So this tint color would almost be like putting a gel over your light and adding a stylistic color. Now next up here is the exposure control. And what this does is just add a power of two to the lighting. So you can see here, all it's really doing is making that lighting more powerful. And you might wonder why we need that with the strength. Well, the thing with the exposure is that we can just go ahead here and we're going to copy this as a new driver and come to our point lights. And we're just going to paste this driver into all of these lights here. And now we have one singular value that can raise the brightness of all the lights in our scene or lower the brightness of the lights in our scene with just one simple zero to one value. Now, lastly, let's talk about this normalized value here. Now this doesn't work for realism, but what this does do is give you a little bit more control over the style of your lighting. So here you can see I have my area light in the scene here, and I have a very large area light. Now, if I turn this off here so you can see what it's affecting here, you can see that it is kind of filling out the entire scene. Now, if I go ahead and scale this down, you can see how the brightness is being reduced because it's a smaller light. If I scale this all the way up, you can see how the scene is getting brighter. Now, what the normalize button does here is just lock that lighting value in. So that way it is controlled strictly by the power of your lighting and not the size of your light. Lastly, let's talk about performance updates. Everybody loves a good performance update and we saw a ton of them in Blender. And there's a lot I'm going to cover here, but there's one big one in particular that I'm going to save for last. But first we got improvements to the compositor, to motion tracking, to liquid sims, to geometry nodes, to object loading, to the video sequence editor, and much, much more. Some of my favorite ones are the fact that the X importer can import up to 15 times faster. If you've ever tried to import a large X file, you've probably experienced Blender hanging up and crashing on you. So I'm excited to see this fixed. Another exciting one is the adaptive subdivision modifier. If you don't know, adaptive subdivision will automatically adapt its subdivision levels to try and account for your displacement map so you can realistically displace your objects and mesh with textures. This is incredible for getting realism in cycles, but previously was so performance heavy, it was kind of hard to use. Let's go ahead and take a look at the character in the scene here. If I go ahead and hit play here, you can see that I have subdivisions, animations, and armature, and more going on in this scene. And what I've done is place a random cube in the scene. Now, if I turn this on, you see it immediately loads with the union, no lag, or calculations needed. Now, if I go ahead here, I can actually switch between the modes and play here in the viewport without any lag. And you can see that it's maintaining a pretty clean geometry line and not giving us any visual glitches. In fact, if I were to switch over to rendered mode here, you can see that overall, it's creating a pretty clean set of geometry to use without interfering with the materials much. Now this is an image-based material, so it's going to cause some artifacts here when it doesn't know what to do with the UVs. But if I go ahead and do a procedural material there, you can see that there's no artifacts in the normals around the edge there, and that the geometry is even maintaining pretty clean geometry. Now, the other cool thing about this is that they've added this manifold geometry to the sculpting mode as well. So if you ever use the mask cuts or booleans in sculpting, you will also get access to these performance gains and cleaner cuts. But the biggest one of all is the fact that now we have Vulkan support out of experimental, meaning it is on par with OpenGL. You can switch this under the edit preferences. And this is such a big update that I've actually done an entire video comparing this to OpenGL, just so you can see the performance boost across the board. And this makes everything in the viewport faster. Your timelines will play back faster. Your animations will play back faster. Your objects will play back faster. You can have more objects in the scene. You can have more modifiers in the scene. It quite literally improves the performance on everything. But in particular, it'll improve the performance on things like subdivisions and sculpting 
and mesh editing more. You can work with millions of vertices much easier. And one of the coolest things is that if you've ever switched to material view or EV mode, you know that there's a shader compilation, and this can take quite a while to load. However, with Vulkan, this loads much, much faster. In my case, I saw it load up to three to five times faster on some of my largest scenes. Some of these scenes I couldn't even open on older versions of Blender because they would crash on the shader building compilation. So I'm really excited that we have full Vulkan support now, and I hope they continue to tune it to be faster in the future. Another exciting new update is the Boolean solver that they've added, which is the Manifold solver. So what I've always loved about Cinema 4D is how clean the Boolean cuts were and how performant they were in the viewport. However, I feel like the ones in Blender have been lagging and oftentimes kind of ruined my geometry and normals. Well, this new manifold solver is much faster and much more efficient. Here you can see it playing on an animation with zero lag at all, but let's look at a more complicated example. Now, one last little bonus feature is I want to point out the fact that they've added randomization to the abilities on making new brushes. And I don't think people understand just quite how powerful this is. If you look at other softwares like Procreate, the way they get those incredibly realistic brush strokes is through a combination of textures and randomization, which we both now have access to. So I'm excited to see what the Blender community creates with this. We covered a lot of features today, so tell me, what's your favorite? Leave in the comments below.